Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. My name is Ed Summers. I'm Director of Accessibility at SAS. And I wanted to introduce or let my partners in crime here introduce themselves. Uh, in our Zoom control room is Lisa Morton. Hi. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, I'm Lisa Morton. I am a project manager at SAS in the R&D division. Happy to be here. Diane? Hi, I'm Diane Bronner. I have 30 years experience as a certified orientation mobility specialist. I also manage the Paths to Technology website, which is a website designed to assist educators and families in learning and staying current on ever-changing technology for students with visual impairments and blindness. Great, thank you. And Diane, I'm so thrilled that you're able to join us today to, to share this information. Uh, Passive Technology has been around for what, about three or four years now, and it has just provided such a wealth of information. When I Google, uh, perform a Google search to try to find, uh, figure out how to do something with assistive technology, quite often uh, one of your posts on Passive Technology is at the top of the list and it gives me the information I need. Can you just share uh, some of the latest um, timely information about technology that could be used in this in this time of distance learning with our folks before we get started? Well, there's all kinds of posts, Ed, on um, passive technology about remote instruction and activities to do with students, about um, all kinds of different pieces of technology, just a lot of things on there. You just have to take a look and browse through. Great, great. Perkins Passive Technology. Okay. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded. And you will, if you register for the webinar, you will receive one more email from me about the webinar, which will uh, include the recording. As soon as we get it transcribed and captioned, we'll get it up, um, get the link out to you. I expect that to be next week. And in that email, there'll also be a link to our next webinar, which is scheduled for June 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern. And that webinar is a companion to this one. It's the follow-up, and that one will focus on the end-user experience of a person with a visual impairment or blindness exploring a, an accessible digital map um, that we will create today. Of course, you can find recordings for all of our SAS accessibility webinars on support.sas.com at, uh, at the SAS Disability Support Center. And the URL for that is support.sas.com slash accessibility, support.sas.com slash accessibility. And that's where you can go get information about today's webinar, previous recordings, and future webinars um, coming up. Uh, we have a lot of people who have joined us today. And for that reason, uh, we muted everybody on entry just so we can kind of manage the chaos. Um, we're thrilled that you're here. And we'll pause for questions a few times throughout the webinar. Um, there's a Q&A section uh, in Zoom. So I want to invite you to type your question in as we go. And we've uh, factored in a few uh, times to stop and answer questions. So please feel free to type your question as we go. OK, so today we're talking about creating accessible digital maps. We have a few learning objectives. So first, you're going to learn how to use Google Maps to create maps that contain points of interest for uh, buildings, intersections, restaurants, bus stops, and other landmarks that can assist a person who is blind or visually impaired uh, with travel. And those could be, say, a tactile landmark, like a particularly noticeable set of steps, or perhaps um, some acoustic landmark. Second, you learn how to export map data from Google Maps and use SAS Graphics Accelerator to create an accessible digital map that can be explored using non-visual methods. And I'll show you those briefly today. Of course, we'll focus, we'll go for a deep dive and focus on that more on June 11th. And then finally, after you create one of those maps, you'll learn how to share the map with your students or clients or colleagues or friends. And you could do that via email. You could put it on your website. There are lots of ways to share. So um, today you'll learn how to create maps and share them. Um, and let's get started. 
So our scenario today um, is, is to create a map for a specific person for a specific purpose. There's all kinds of maps. There's all kinds of reasons why we might create them. Uh, today, uh, the scenario is that I, as a professional uh, computer scientist that is blind, uh, I need to travel to UNC Chapel Hill. So UNC is just about uh, 20 miles away uh, from SAS and in my house here in Cary. And about once or twice, uh, once every two years, once, or, once every year or two, um, I'm privileged to be invited to go over and do a guest lecture uh, in a class at UNC's School of Computer Science. Well, I get over there about once every two years, and I'm not you know, particularly familiar with the campus. So I've asked Diane Bronner, uh, my friend and o &M instructor, to create a map for me that can help me. Um, I can just follow away on my computer, and when I need to hop on the bus and go over to Chapel Hill to Citizen Hall, where the School of Computer Science is, I can refresh my memory of the location of the bus stop in relation to Citizen Hall and a few other uh, places of interest that I might want to visit while I'm over on campus. So that's our scenario. And uh, we're, we'll just go ahead and jump right in and navigate right to the map. Okay. On my screen, uh, you can see uh, this is the landing page where you register for the webinar. And I'm just going to press H a couple times in JAWS. About the webinar heading level two. Target audience heading level two. Recording heading level two. Related resources heading level two. Okay, there's some related resources here. Now I'll press tab. SAS Graphics Accelerator for Google Chrome Link. How to create accessible digital maps using SAS Graphics Accelerator and Google Maps Link. Using a digital map for work travel link. Okay. Here's a blog post uh, using a digital map for work travel. I'll, let's open that blog post. Control Shift Enter Untitled Dash Google Chrome. Using a digital map for work travel vertical bar paths to technology vertical bar Perkins e learning dash Google Chrome. UNC. Okay. This is our uh, a blog post that Diane created um, on Perkins Paths to Technology, which you can access or, of course, Google for it. And um, in this blog post, uh, she included a link to the map. That she created. SAS Graphics Accelerator Resources Heading Level 2. Oops, let me go back up here. And... Visited link UNC Campus Citizen Hall Map. There we go. The UNC Campus Citizen Hall Map is a link within this blog post. Control Shift Enter. Using a digital map for work travel vertical bar path. Okay. So this is, uh, the map is opened and, uh, well, the, the, the initial map is opened. But if you're running SAS Graphics Accelerator, if you've installed that free extension from the Google Chrome uh, web store, then you will have an accelerate button. Wrapping the top, accelerate UNC campus, citizen all button. Right here on this map. I'm going to click that button. Enter untitled dash Google Chrome. Graph view cold. All right. And now I'm in SAS Graphics Accelerator and I can explore the map. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is just zoom in a couple of times because Diane said by default this, this thing was zoomed out pretty far. And let me just press uh, the plus key here. Equals one mile, showing 50 equals 1,500 yards, showing equals 1,000 yards, showing 15 of 17 objects. Okay, so I've zoomed in, and the if you can see the screen, the object you'll see in the center of the screen there is called the lens. And the lens is how we view a portion of a map. And within my lens, I can move around, I can zoom, pan, do all the things you normally do in a map. Uh, and the first thing that I want to do, though, when I come in to Chapel Hill, I'll be on the Go Triangle 800 bus, and it will drop me off, or I'll get off, at... Uh, a bus stop right on South Street near the student store. So let me find that that place on the map. I'm gonna press the J key. J jump modal dialog. Search colon edit. Seventeen I'll results. Just type for bus. I'll type bus. Boop. S two results. Okay. Press tab. Jump to location colon list box. Bus stop four. South Road at student stores. Inbound eight hundred on north side of street. Semi colon outbound on south side of street. One of two. There we go. And I'll be on the inbound on the north side of the street. So let me hit return. Enter. Moving to bus stop four. South Road at student stores. Inbound eight hundred on north side of street. Semi colon outbound on south side of street. Showing fifteen of seventeen objects. Great. So now I'm viewing the map. My virtual location, which is visually presented as the very center of this of the lens, the circle on the screen, is at the bus stop on South Road, right by the student stores. Okay, I know where that is in the real world. Now the maps, when you explore them in SAS Graphics Accelerator, by default or, or always actually, um, the north is straight up towards the top of the screen. And that means west is straight to the left and east is straight to the right. And this is very standard for any kind of an online map. Okay. And now, when those of us who are blind learn how to navigate the world safely, we learn how to use what's called a long cane. 
Uh, my long cane is I don't know, somewhere around four, maybe four and a half feet long. And with that cane, I can sweep an arc around me. If I were to put it in my hand or reach it out, and there might be an arc of about six feet. As I'm standing, if I were really standing at this bus stop right now in Chapel Hill, then I could sweep my cane around and I might detect objects in my environment with that cane and get information about those objects. So I could, I might detect a trash can over to my right and I'll swing over to the left and maybe accidentally hit somebody's leg. Oops, sorry about that. Okay, that's, that's somebody's leg, it feels like. And I can sweep in 360 degrees. Well, we designed SASCRAFT's accelerator to allow you to do the same thing, but virtually. And my cane at this point extends from the center of this lens all the way to the edge, and I've zoomed in so that that distance is, is 1,000 yards. Okay, now, as I work with this, you might notice that this map does not look to you visually, if you can see this visually, you might notice it doesn't look like, like you would expect a map to look. And that's true, because you're seeing uh, the kind of visual version of what somebody would experience as they explore the map non-visually. So just like when you look at Braille, it doesn't look like normal print, uh, this map doesn't look like a normal map because people perceive it in different ways. So I'm standing at the bus stop here. My virtual location is the bus stop. North is towards the, the top of the screen. I can swing my cane clockwise or counterclockwise. And I know that from here, I think I remember that Citizen Hall is somewhere off to the west. So I'm just gonna start swinging my cane counterclockwise. So I'll just press the, let me turn off my echo keys here in JAWS. Both characters and words, none. All right. Now I'm going to press um, page up to swing my cane counterclockwise. You are at bus stop four, South Road at Student Stores, inbound 800 on North Side of Street, semicolon outbound on South Side of Street. Okay, the first point that I come to is the one that I'm standing on right now, so I'll press it again. East Franklin Street and North Columbia Street, 895 yards at 10 o'clock. Okay, so 895 yards at 10 o'clock, I heard, is one of the main intersections there in uh, Chapel Hill, and that's a good point of reference for me. I'll press page up again. Trolley stop hot dogs on intersection of West Franklin Street and South Columbia Street, restaurant 948 yards at 10 o'clock. Okay, that's one of the important stops for my journey because the trolley stop has the best hot dogs in Chapel Hill. Um, there's another one in Wrightsville Beach. If you ever get down to Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, uh, that's the place to go in Wrightsville Beach as well. Delicious hot dogs. Um, so I will definitely stop by there when I go over. So let me keep going. South Columbia and Cameron Ave intersection, 670 yards at 9 o'clock. Okay, so that one's 670 yards. It's a little closer in. And as you could hear, the tone that was played for that particular intersection was a little different. So listen to this. South Columbia and Cameron Ave intersection, 670 yards at 9 o'clock. It's a little higher pitch. Now what's going on there is that the pitch of the sound that I touch with, of this point that I touched my virtual cane is higher as, uh, as it moves closer to me. So any of the near points will be high pitch. The low points out towards the edge will have a lower pitch, right? And, and you'll see a little bit more of that as we keep going. So listen for that. Press the page uh, up again. School of Education on South Columbia and East Cameron Ave, 618 yards at 9 o'clock. Okay, keep going. Citizen Hall at South Columbia Street, Academic Building, 576 yards at 9 okay. o'clock. And that's, that's a little closer, right? That's 570 yards, about halfway in from the edge. Okay, good to know. That's my destination. Um, let's see, let's hear it again. Citizen Hall at South Columbia Street, Academic Building, 576 yards at 9 o'clock. Okay, 576 yards at 9 o'clock. Great, that's pretty much due west from my current location. Can I walk directly there? I'm not sure. Let me keep exploring. Brooks Hall, Academic Building, attached to Citizen Hall, 545 yards at 9 o'clock. I'll keep going. Keenan Science Building, Academic Building, Lab and Library on South Road, 427 yards at 9 o'clock. Okay, so remember, I'm currently, my, my virtual position is currently on South Road, and the Keenan, the Keenan Science Building is also on South Road. So that's a landmark for me to perhaps see as I go by, and I'll keep going. South Columbia Street and South Road, intersection, 590 yards at 8 o'clock. Okay, that's my intersection. I'm gonna, I, I'll need to walk basically kind of west, a little bit southwest from my current position down to, to Columbia Street. And then I'll need to turn right to go north, right? So let me just jump directly to this intersection, right? Because that's my next kind of waypoint. So I'll just hit return here. Moving to South Columbia Street and South Road intersection, showing 15 of 17 objects. Now, the entire map shifted. My new virtual location is um, this intersection. So let me uh, explore around and see if I can find Citizen Hall. Keenan Science Building, Academic Building, Lab and Library on South Road, 84 yards at 2 o'clock. Frank Porter Graham Student Center, Keenan Science you are at South Columbia Street and South Road, intersection. 
All right, and just pressing page up and page down. Just look around a little bit here. Brooks Hall, academic building, attached to Citizen Hall, 142 yards at 11 o'clock. Okay, 11 o'clock, that's Brook Hall, right next to Citizen Hall. I'll press page up again. School of Education on South Columbia and East Cameron Ave, 282 yards at 11 o'clock. Okay. Citizen Hall at South Columbia Street, academic building, 203 yards at 11 o'clock. Okay, so 200 yards up, you know, going north on South Columbia um, Street is my destination of Citizen Hall. So we went through this really fast. Uh, this is the way that I would use this map that Diane created uh, in order to refresh my memory about exactly uh, how I get to where I need to go um, in Chapel Hill. So let's pause here to see if there's any questions that have come in and we'll take a few questions if there are any and then we'll move right over into creating a map just like this. And keep in mind, um, we went through this part pretty fast, knowing that our next webinar on June 11th at 3 p.m. Eastern will dive into this in a much more detail. And we'll also maybe look at another few maps um, to look at different types of maps. So with that, Lisa, do you have any questions? I do, Ed, I do. People are jazzed, man. I've got a question in from Beth. Um, it's it's a good one. She's she says she logged had to log in with her phone, so it looks much different. So she's not able to see chat messages, you know, with the Zoom. But she's asking, was there an opening code? Um, you know, how did you get to where you are now? So you might want to review again what the accelerator is. Oh yeah, okay. So SAS Graphics Accelerator. Thank you for that question, Beth. SAS Graphics Accelerator mm -hmm. is a, an extension. It's a free extension for Google Chrome. And if you go to the landing page where you registered for this webinar, you can, uh, in the related resources section, there is now a link to SAS Graphics Accelerator um, where you can install it and you can access this map using one of the other links there in the related resources section, which is the third one down. And it's called, I believe, Using Digital Maps for Work Travel, I believe. So Take a look at that and get started. If you run into a roadblock, send us an email at accessibility at sas.com, accessibility at sas.com, and we'll help you get through it. Excellent. Got another question for you, Ed. Uh, Shannon wants to know, is this accessible with a refreshable Braille display? Yeah, so uh, JAWS, uh, with JAWS, you can turn on flash messages and you should be able to read these messages. Um, I believe it's called flash messages. Uh, don't. Uh, Get me, don't, don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I looked at it, but JAWS has a way to make sure that these uh, these messages do show up uh, on your Braille display. So give that a try, and if it doesn't work for you, let us know. Great, and uh, got one more question for you coming in from Tara. She noticed uh, you're using JAWS. Can you use um, this with Chrome Vox, V-O-X? We have tested this very lightly with Chromevox on a Chromebook. Yes, we have. Um, it's been many releases since we've done it, and I know they've changed and we changed and whatnot. So um, I, I would I would recommend if you can uh, JAWS or NVDA on Windows. I know works great. We test that all the time. We test um, Voiceover on Mac every release, um, but give Chromevox a try and let me know if it does not work. We have not looked at looked at that in several months. And um, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, That's let's a do goodie. one more question. Yeah, yeah it's uh, from Steve, Ideal Group. How does the user know when they are facing due north, since all instructions are based on north, south, east, west direction? There's a second part. Also, would it make sense to indicate direction by including more accurate positions, including half-hour directions, like 930? Yeah, yeah, you bet. Um, so, Steve, the first thing, first question is, uh, first answer is that uh, you're always facing north. So, north is always the top of the screen. It never changes. So, you're always facing north. That means west is always to my left and east is always to my right. And by the way, you can't, you guys can't tell this, but the sounds that you're hearing are also spatial. They use the spatial audio API so that if you put in your earbuds, then you'll be able to hear, oh, that, that sound to nine o'clock. Um, is um, is absolutely uh, to my left. It's completely coming out of my coming into my left ear. So that helps as well. Now to your second question, uh, to the directions. Um, SAS Graphics Accelerator supports a 
a key, um, a, a configuration key. There's lots of different configurations here that allow you to switch between a couple of different um, ways of hearing direction. So let's try that. I'll press I. Cardinal. Center Symbolic South Columbia Street, Academic Building, 203 yards north by northwest. Okay, that's north by northwest, same kind of thing. And then let's switch it one more time. Bearing. Center Symbolic South Columbia Street, Academic Building, 203 yards at 334 degrees. 334 degrees, that's a little to the west of, uh, of due north. And I'll come back around, press I one more time. Clock. Center Symbolic South Columbia Street, Academic Building, 203 yards at 11 o'clock. So there's three different choices for you there, Steve, um, to choose between how you want the uh, direction announced. All right. Thank you all for those questions. And let's see if we're anywhere near time on track. 3.22 p.m. We, I, I took seven more minutes than I should have. So I, I stole <laughs> seven minutes from Diane. Let's switch shift right over to Diane. Diane, let me um, try to stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Meeting controls. Okay. Menu, mute, yeah. currently unmuted. Audio settings, but start my video button. Video settings, open you participants can. panel, 98 part. Hang on just one second. Question and answer, pause button, new share button, pause share button, remote control, more button drop down, dock the top button, stop share button, enter, meeting share go. screen button, S. You should build All a right. share screen now. Share my screen. Content left panel. And hang on. There we go. All right. Space. Now you demand. should see my screen. I have uh, Google Chrome up. I am going to go ahead and show you how you make these maps. Now, the first thing I want to say is that these maps are custom made, meaning that you can put in exactly what you want into this map. So it's a little bit different than using Google Maps where all those points are always announced to you. I am going to choose the points that I want and put them into my map. So as an orientation mobility specialist, the first thing I always do is ask myself, what is the goal of the map and what is my student or my client's level? So this goal of the map, for this particular map, is to get Ed from the bus stop coming into Chapel Hill to Sitterson Hall. So he doesn't need to know the entire campus or the entire Chapel Hill. All he needs to know are the main things that are along that route. Plus, of course, he wants to stop for lunch for hot dogs. So I added that one in. Now, um, Ed is a tech-savvy, independent traveler. If I was using a map with a third grader, that map may be of his neighborhood with only a few points in it. So I can add points or I can add different tags, different pieces of information into my custom-made map. So always think about the goal of the map and the student's level. Now I'm in Google Chrome. I am going to search for my maps dot google.com again it's my maps dot google.com when that comes up i have the option that on the left hand side there's a create a new map it's a red button i'm going to go ahead and select this now the a map of the united states comes up i want to look specifically at unc oops let me type that in UNC Chapel Hill. So I'm going to type that into the search box and it automatically zooms into the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I am still going to zoom in manually a little bit farther as I want to come right into campus and take a look around. Now, maybe I don't know where it is it, much about campus. So I can type in in the search bar and the text field, edit text field, I can type in what it is I'm looking for. So I want to look for bus stops um, at the student stores, which is where Ed's bus will drop him off. I type that in in the search. It comes, um, a pop-up in my map comes up and says South Road at student stores, gives me the address. And in that pop-up, I can say add to map. So now it's zoomed in on this part of the map so I can easily read the road. I can see different buildings that are marked um, and gives me a lot of information. So I'm going to add to map. I'm going to select on that. And then the tag currently says South Road at Student Stores. I want to edit that tag. So I'm going to hit the pencil, the edit icon. And I'm going to change this to say... 
bus stop? Because that makes more sense to me. If I want to search for it or like Ed wanted to search, he wanted to search for bus stop. Now, I know just because I look this up on the bus route, I know that that's bus stop number four. So I'm going to say bus stop four. And then I'm going to put another tag in there. And that tag is going to say what road it's on. So it's bus stop number four on south, oops, south road. I can type. Let me do that again. South road. And I can say at student stores. Okay. Now for Ed, he wanted the information that he was riding the inbound 800 bus. That would be the name of the bus. I can add that in. I can also give him the information that it's uh, the inbound is on the north side of the street, but the outbound is on the south side of the street. So I can choose how much information I want to put in there or, or leave out is up to me. So I'm going to go ahead and hit save. Now on the left hand side of my screen is um, where this saves to. And now I have a whole column here of things that I'm going to save. I want to go back and I want to title my map. So this time I'm going to call it UNC Campus. And I'm just going to say it's a practice map because we're not going to fill the whole thing out. I can also put a description on that, and then I'm going to hit save. So now I have a title for my map, UNC Campus Practice, and I have one stop on there. So I'm going to X out of that pop-up, and then I am going to go back up to the search bar because I want to find Citizen Hall, which is a computer science building. So I'm going to say Citizen Hall Computer Science. The map moves over, and I am automatically have a little pin now on the computer science building. I can add the map. I'm going to go ahead and add the map. I'm going to edit this. It currently says Department of Computer Science, and I want to call it Citizen Hall. And then I'm going to give the information about what street it's on. So I'm going to type in on South Columbia Street. Now notice I am writing out all the abbreviations. So South is not S period, it's South spelled out. Same with Street. And I am doing that so that um, the screen reader JAWS or voiceover, whatever you're using, will read it out in, in a way that makes sense to everybody. So I am spelling out all my abbreviation, abbreviated words. Okay, so I'm going to hit save. So now that is over here on the left-hand side of my column of things on the, my map. Now I think it's important as an O&M to give some information. If Ed missed the Sutterson Hall stop, if he kept going, he's going to get to the intersection of West Cameron Avenue and um, South Columbia Street. So I can go up and select the little icon for add a marker. And I can come back and um, click on the intersection. It automatically says 0.3 because it's the third thing in my list. But I'm going to change that and say Cameron Avenue and South Columbia. Via street, and I'm going to call it comma, and I'm going to say intersection. Okay, then I'm going to hit save. So I can keep on doing that. I can come down another important one to mark. I'm going to go up to my add marker. I'm going to go down to the intersection of South Columbia Street and South Road. So I'm going to say South Columbia. Street and South Road, comma, intersection, and save. Now, some of the other things that I would want to put in here, 
on a map. If I'm doing a campus map, I usually like to put the boundary roads or the boundary markers of the campus. So I might want to say if South Road was the, the farthest road on the south side, I would mark South Road at the intersection of Columbia. If that was the, the corner of the campus, I would go up and mark the other four corners as well. And that would kind of give a boundary of where the campus is. With UNC and Chapel Hill, there really isn't a good boundary on the north side and on the east side so much. Um, so I, I may do that or I may not, depending on the campus. Now I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so you can see. One thing that I think is important um, riding a bus is I might go back and mark the intersection that is just before Ed's bus stop. So he would be prepared if he hears that intersection, that name, and know that that next bus stop would be for him. I might come out and do the intersection, the major intersection, as his bus comes in. And it comes in on 54, which is a, a highway, and it crosses 501, and then it goes on into campus. And so I might mark that intersection to give him a good idea of this is where it's really, really busy intersection, telling him he's coming into campus. Um, I might also mark down here another intersection of a major road coming into campus. Um, this is 86 coming up. This is the way I come into campus. Um, so I could click on that and mark this as 86 and 15501 intersection. And that would kind of give a better boundary of when you're crossing into campus or into Chapel Hill, so you would be more aware of when you're coming into your bus stop. So pretty much what Ed's trying to do with these maps is he's trying to get a mental map in his mind of the layout, what's there, some um, points of interest, as well as a mental map of the direction he needs to go. Um, Ed does not use turn-by-turn -turn directions using his GPS. He, he uses a mental map, and that's what I do with my students. I teach the kids how to have a mental map of the area and to figure out where they are. Um, I can also do landmarks such as acoustical landmarks. There's a really nice water fountain. Um, I could mark that. I could mark something that's very obvious, maybe a, a big downhill or a big uphill or a change in surface. If my student was going to use that to help them on a particular route or that's really important landmark, I would put those landmarks in as well. Okay. So right now, I only have, um, what, four landmarks in there, so my map does not have enough information. But I want to show you how to go from Google Maps, mymaps.google, um, and how I'm going to share this, how I'm going to use this. So back up here on the left-hand side, where it says the name of my map, UNC Campus Practice, there are three dots. I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to come down and export to KML slash KMZ. Those are my options. I have lots of new options in here. I'm going to say export. When I click on that, there's now a pop-up, and it says entire map. Yes, I want my entire map. And I'm going to select export as KML instead of KMZ. So I want KML. Now I'm going to select download. OK, so now it has downloaded. All right. Let me get to where I need to go. OK, oops, I still need full screen. It has downloaded. I could save it. Um, on my desktop or I can leave it in downloads and I actually do have to get out of full screen because I cannot get up to my SAS. Um, here's my SAS graphics accelerator. It's my extension that I have downloaded into uh, Google Chrome and it was covered by my Zoom notice. So um, I'm going to go ahead and select that blue S. And I'm going to extract, I'm going to hit laboratory. 
and I'll make it full screen again. So now I want to import my table. So I have a choice in my laboratory to create a table, import a table, or manage my tables. I'm going to select import table. And I have a pop-up. Uh, my table is in downloads. If I had saved it to my desktop or Dropbox or wherever, I could grab it from there. But I have put it in, it left it in my download, and we call this UNC Campus Practice. So I'm going to come down to UNC Campus Practice. I'm going to select that and open it. So now you see a table. It says Prepare Table at the top. And it tells me the title, UNC Campus Practice. We only put four points in there right now, so my table's very small. I'm going to hit Save to Laboratory. Now I'm on the Table UNC Campus Practice page. I'm going to create my map. So I'm going to select Create Map. And this says Create Map at the top. So there's a latitude and a longitude, and those are both already selected. There's only one option. Under the third column label, I have the choice of name. I want my labels to be names, the names that I gave, like Citizen Hall or Bus Stop. So I'm going to select name. The, it automatically gives me a map name, but I want the same name. So I'm going to say UNC Campus practice map and the footnote. Now this is important. Um, the data, the map data is from Google Maps. So map data provided by Google Maps. We want to make sure that we give credit where credit's due. Now I'm done with my form. So I'm going to hit submit. When I do that, I'm back on my table, UNC Campus Practice page. And now there's a link that's highlighted, and it says UNC Campus Practice Map. I'm going to select that. And there we are. There's my map with my four points. So this is the map that looks just like what Ed was doing, only four points instead of his head, 17 points. Now, if I want to share this map with ads, I want to download it as an HTML. So I can go up and select the download as HTML. And here it is again in my downloads. It says UNC Campus Practice Map.html. And that's what I would save and share with Ed or a student or a client. Okay, so that was a ton of information that we went through very quickly. Does anybody have any questions for me? Oh, yes. Good. Lots of questions. Okay. Really good questions. Um, I'd like to start with this one because I think it frames things out. Someone wants to ask the question, what is KML? All right, Ed, do you want to answer that one? It's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Audio muted. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, KML is Keyhole Markup Language, and it was a it's a it's a version of XML that was created specifically to be able to share geospatial data like um, like it's contained in this map. KML. So you can, if you wanted to learn more, you could take a look at um, Wikipedia. I believe has a pretty good ca uh, page for Keyhole Markup Language. Excellent. Uh, Vicenzo has a lot of great questions. Um, just to know, does this service support creating maps for indoor areas, like university buildings? Okay, Ed, do you want to answer that one, or you want me to? Uh, have you tried a, an indoor building yet? I have not yet. That's okay. on my to-do list. Right. This is this is so new. Uh, it, there's several things that we want to try. <laughs> right now, we're, we're we've been playing a lot with campus maps. Um, but I would encourage you to go give it a try. If it can be represented in Google Maps, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then I think it will probably work. I would recommend that you use the little ad marker uh, uh, 
uh, method that Diane showed where she dropped a pin. I think that might work best. Give it a try. Let me know how it goes. Send me an email at accessibility at sas.com. I'd love to know. Mm-hmm. And can, um, can a blind person make an accessible map from Google Maps? Yeah, at this time, I don't think that's possible. I've tried and I just couldn't get through it. Um, so uh, right now, uh, I, my, my best bet is to enlist my good friend Diane to make maps for me. Now, that said, if I can find data in a CSV format or even in a KML format already that's on the web, which there's a, a lot of it out there, what I do is I import that data directly in the SAS Graphics Accelerator. And then as Diane showed you there, after, the, after you get done with the import, you can filter the data. So for example, just maybe for a certain latitude, longitude, things like that. And then I can create a map uh, myself as a blind person using that process. All right, got a couple of other ones if we've got time. Does SAS support the creation of lines and polygons? Lines and polygons are not supported at this time. Stay okay. tuned. <laughs> <laughs> And here's a good one. Um, can these maps be consumed via SAS Graphics Accelerator by using a mobile phone? Uh, SAS Graphics Accelerator is only supported on desktops right now. So Mac and Windows, Chrome on desktops is the current environment that it's supported right now. Okay. Um, let's see. Are any maps? Are there any maps that are pre-made, or do you have to make all the maps yourself as a certified OM? OM, O&M, sorry. Yeah, this is so new um, that I think the only accessible maps that I've that I've seen is, is the are the maps that Diane has created on Perkins Pass the technology. Diane, do you want to just maybe point out a couple of the maps that are out there right now that you've created thus far? Absolutely. So on um, Pass Technology, um, I am creating posts, more and more posts, and I, I plan to do more about these maps because. I am on fire about how cool these maps are. Um, So there are some maps there on Passive Technology right now. Ed and I did a workshop recently for some O&Ms who are creating maps as part of their workshop. So I hope to put those maps on Passive Technology as well. So I want to do a a sample group of maps. So maybe an airport. I've talked about doing Disney World. Um, You know, some of these tourist places that the kids might be very interested in. I also want to do a post on a map that's included in a social studies textbook. So how do you apply that to academics as well as to o and purposes? So right now, there's not a whole lot out there that are made, but I really, really encourage you to take a look at some of those posts. And then if you make a map, share it with me and I'll make a list of maps that are available on Pence Technology. Um, You know, Ed hasn't really said this yet, but using Google Maps in conjunction with the SAS Graphic Accelerator, that software has only been out, Ed, what, two weeks, three weeks now? About two weeks. Yes, it's brand new. And um, I would just add, there are some other kind of what I would consider to be more scientific maps that that are available on support.sas.com slash accessibility in our samples uh, section. So, for example, there are some COVID-19 maps that show county-level data, infections and things like that, by county for the U.S. And for different areas of the world, it's a global map. So, different areas of the world may be at the country level or the province or state level, depending on how that country is reporting their COVID-19 testing. So, if you go check out samples on support.sas.com slash accessibility, you can find maps that are more you know, more of a scientific nature. And, um, you know, the other thing about this is we, we, we created this technology to enable all kinds of maps, both for scientific reasons, for economics, for political science, um, public health, you name it. So there's a lot of potential applications here. What we're focusing on, focusing on today is primarily for O&M, you know, for, for being able to find the, the bus stop and, and the hot dogs. Um, but there's, from an academic perspective, there's a lot more potential here that we haven't covered. And I would encourage you, if you're an O&M, to reach out to your TVI and maybe share the recording of this uh, webinar to see how you guys might collaborate to you know, build a bridge between what's going on in the classroom and what's going on in the O&M lessons. 
Um, do we have time for a couple more questions? Maybe. Uh, let's do a time check. Why are we, are we... Okay, it's it's three it's three forty six. All right, so. we we have plenty of time for questions. Okay, great. Right. Here's a practical use one. Um, um, Elizabeth wants to know if this is only supported on a computer. How does Ed use it when traveling? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, so uh, Diane and I, we've been collaborating for a long time in, in this area of technology and for in many realms. And you know, we feel pretty strongly that our students and clients out there should be learning uh, how to build their own mental maps of, of spaces. Um, I and Diane, we're not a big fan of rote route travel because that makes somebody either dependent on technology or dependent on, um, on their own end to help them learn the next route to the next place, let's say at the beginning of every semester. And and, and we want to teach people to fish, um, not to hand them fish, right? Okay, so how does that work out? Um, one thing is these kinds of maps become uh, reference maps, right? So I'm building my own little library of maps so that before I go out the door to go over to UNC to give my, my lecture, um, I can reference this map, kind of refresh my memory. Great, okay. So I get on the bus. Okay, I have a pretty good idea, and I will guarantee you that that I've learned enough O and M skills that I can get off that bus without a single piece of technology, and I can find Citizen Hall. How? Because either a because of the sun or the wind or whatever it is, I can generally tell direction. I know that South Road runs roughly east west right there. Okay, great. I'm coming in on the north side of the street. Great. I get off of the bus. I step out. I turn left. Okay, I'm walking down the street. Okay, and then I'm gonna go, I know you know, one of my steps at full speed is about a yard. So if I need to go, I think it was 500 yards down to, um, down to South Columbia Street and turn right. First off, I know it's a major intersection, so I can hear it, right? It's not, it's not a little down curb. Um, I can hear the stop and go of the traffic, okay? And I have a pretty good idea of what a quarter of a mile is. I, I've, I've learned, and this is something you should be teaching your, your students and clients, is how to do your time and distance, you know, and to be able to judge how far I'm going. Uh, and then I'm going to turn right. And I, I think it was another 200 yards north. Okay, great. Well, if it's middle of the day in the wintertime, the, the sun's going to be to my back. And I, I know that I know I'm going north. I can always stop. Hey, you know, is this is, is it this way to Cameron Avenue? I know Cameron Avenue is further up north. Um, I'll stop a student walking by. Hey, is, is this Brooks Hall or is this Citizen Hall or whatever? No, it's a little bit up. Okay, fine. Great. I can do all that without technology. But I'm a tech savvy traveler. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use Blind Square or Nearby Explorer, I've switched back and forth between the two, to know where the intersections are. But I'm not walking with that technology in my hand. I'm going to put it in my pocket, and I'm going to enjoy the day. I'm going to listen to the smells and the sounds moving by and the chatter of the students, and and I'm not going to have my head in my phone. One, because it's not safe, and two, because I'd like to be able to pay attention to what's going on around me. And if I feel like I'm getting lost, I'll pull out my phone, bring it up, do a quick check. Oh, yeah, okay, Columbia Street's just another 100 yards up. Cool. Put it back in my pocket. Keep going. So that's a that was a long winded answer, Elizabeth. I hope that <laughs> answered your question. <laughs> it's such it's such a great question. It is. I liked it too. Thanks, Ed. Um, here's another one. Um, can you send these SAS created maps to an embosser? Yes, you can. Yes, mm-hmm. you can. Um, but I would recommend that uh, what works really well in this case. I want you to go look at TouchMapper.org. And I just put up uh, a blog post on Perkins Pass the Technology about touchmapper.org, which allows you to print uh, street maps of uh, surrounding locations. Um, Diane, could you possibly find that find that um, blog post real quick in your search there, if you're still sharing your screen? Keep on going, and I'll look for it. Okay, yeah. So touchmapper.org is a free um, a, a website that allows you to go type in a... a address and then you can create from that address a map of um, the streets and buildings to some degree surrounding a particular location and you can print it on a 3D printer, which is my favorite way to do it. Uh, I have one in my garage or you can also create a, a, a different kind of file like an SVG file, for example, that can be printed on a Tato graphics embosser or a or it's a PIOF, I think, um, is the other mm-hmm. type of file that might support. Yeah. So maybe we have the blog post up. Uh, 
Uh-huh. It's up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great. Uh, using catch mapper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So if you go uh, to this particular blog post on Perkins Paths Technology, you'll see the best practices that Diana, Diane and I have worked out for this particular technology, which is very exciting. It has its pros and cons, but um, when it comes to actually feeling the direction of the roads and which, which where the sidewalks are on the, on the roads, it's really great for a, for a large scale map for pedestrian purposes. Ready for another question? Let's do it. Awesome. Um, Tara wants to know any checklists available that contain the keyboard commands using JAWS to explore these SAS maps? Great question. If you open the map, if you click the little accelerate button and you open the map in SAS Graphics Accelerator, if you press H on your keyboard, that will bring up your context sensitive help commands. And that page, that help page also, by the way, contains a link to our maps tutorial. Excellent. Well, when I do want to mention, I'm on Pass the Technology on my screen right now, and you can do a technology search here and look for the maps, or you can just take a look right now. They're, um, they're recently added. So there's several in here. There's remote O&M instruction for students transitioning to college. That one is a really good one. Um, activities that build digital map skills. How do you get kids started on using these maps? Um, SAS Graphic Accelerator map students uploading and and accessible, accessing, I can't talk, student uploading and accessing maps. There's several more, but if you open these up, that list of keyboard commands is in several of these posts. And the posts also have step-by-step directions. And then um, I'm going to not try not to make you dizzy here by scrolling down. There's some maps here that you can download and try yourself. And then there's links to other posts um, along the same line. And just a reminder, on June 11th at 3 o'clock, we're going to take a deep dive into actually exploring maps. And during that deep dive, I'll introduce to you what I believe. This varies by the person. Some people love it. Some people don't. Um, (laughs) You can use a video game controller in conjunction with SAS Graphics Accelerator to explore these maps. And it provides a really great haptic experience. Um, You know, if you can use a keyboard or the video game controller, but I love it for jumping into a map and getting a quick overview of where the data is and zooming around basically and exploring the map from different perspectives. For me, it's the most efficient. So we'll, we'll dive deeper into both of those access methods. Uh, Leanna wants to know, what formats um, do documents need to be in to use the SAS Graphics Accelerator? Excel, doc, PDF? She's curious. Great. So, uh, Let's see, right now you can import data into SAS Graphics Accelerator from KML files like we just did. Um, Excel files in XLSX format, right? The the latest Excel format. Uh, CSV, so your comma separated values files and tab separated values files. So that's typically a TSV or maybe it's a, it might be a text file. So those are our current supported uh, import types. Now, the other thing you can do is, and I do this all the time, is um, very frequently I encounter tables of data on web pages. So for example, maybe in Wikipedia, a Wikipedia page has a table of data. It might have geocoded data in the table. And in SAS Graphics Accelerator, you can extract data from tables on web pages, which is great because I can extract data right out of the table from the Wikipedia page and either create a map or a graph and explore that data more effectively. Because you know, exploring data in a tabular format with a screen reader, it's really slow. And, and if it's bigger, it's a bigger table, then, then it's really hard to comprehend it. And that's why we have charts, graphs, and maps. So um, Diane, can you just quickly maybe go to, the, your, go to the little blue S up there at the top and just click on that to show folks what I'm talking about there with the extract tables from this page. Okay, hang on. So if you can just open the pop-up, then that might just, um, you don't have to click on the button itself, but just open the pop-up. After make my screen smaller. There we go. Here is the SAS symbol um, and extract tables from this page. There you go. Yep. And it might not do it. You don't have to click it because there, there's no tables. It won't do anything. But if right. you can't see the screen, the way that you get to that on Windows, at least, is in Chrome, press your Alt key, and that'll move your focus to your uh, Chrome button. 
And then if you just use the left arrow to move across the little icons of your extensions that you've installed until you hear SAS Graphics Accelerator, then press the space bar. That'll open the pop-up we're talking about. And then you can tab to the extract uh, tables from this page or the laboratory or the help or the options or anything else in the pop-up. Okay. And um, here's a good question. Another good question from Vincenzo. Supposing that the blind person knows the area to be mapped very well, mm -hmm. is the map creation process accessible with a screen reader? The way I would do that is mm -hmm. I would, if you, if, you, if you want to, I would go out with my GPS device. I would um, make some points of interest. Okay, and, and, and that way I got real good GPS. Look, it was as good as I can get, which is about five meters for um, for the type of technology that we can use. And then I would go home, and I would open up my laptop, and I would open up a spreadsheet or a CSV file, and I would type in the GPS um, locations for each point that I'm interested in, and I would import that into SAS Graphics Accelerator, and then I have therefore, and then I could create my map. That would be one way to do it. If your GPS um, if your GPS application allows you to export KML files, all the better, boom, you just export, import that KML file directly into SASH Graphics Accelerator to make your map. Very good. And we've got a couple of, a few comments people are, are observing that the idea is to create the maps to preview a location before and going out onto the location. Um, got a lot of questions, a number of questions about if it's available on a mobile phone. And I think we covered that. Um, somebody wants to go to Disney. They want a map of Disney, Ed. Who does? Diane? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then there's some questions about some reference links. Just so everybody knows, we will be sending out those reference links. And we can also include um, the link that um, Diane showed about TouchMapper, the TouchMapper page. We can include that as well. Um, and somebody just downloaded it. So Great. The, the accelerator. So Great. yeah, yeah. Give it a try. Yeah. Those in, in the related resources there on the landing page, there's a link to SAS Graphics Accelerator. You can go download it for free into Google Chrome mm -hmm. and uh, give it a try with one of these maps uh, that Diane's already created. Yep. And that's, that's, that's it. about it. Oh, yeah. terrific. Well, Thank all of you so much for joining us. And Diane, always a pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Well, we might have lost Diane, but Lisa, thank you for hosting. And um, My pleasure. just a reminder, June 11th, 3 p.m., we're diving deeper into exploring maps using SAS Graphics Accelerator. And we hope to see you then.